In this episode of Bizjet TV, we're going to be talking about how the private jet is actually a catalyst to doing deals. We're going to be meeting with um, YouTube-based entrepreneur Chris Crone, who's big into real estate and buying businesses. Uh, so he'll tell us his story of how he started um, and how he got into business and then started to really you know, scale his business. Um, starting with real estate and then moving into buying businesses and that and when when did the private jet come into his you know business toolkit um, he'll tell us that story and he always tell us you know I, he says in the interview he says I just don't know why my mentors didn't tell me about private jets 10 years before because I would have started using them 10 years earlier so this is really really interesting because people always think that you know you, to buy a private jet you need tons and tons of money and you only do it when you already achieve success but again, here is a story of somebody that, you know, went in early and says, I should have got in a lot earlier. So let's get into today's interview with Chris Crumb. But before we do that, if you haven't done so already, you need to get yourself a copy of the quantum economy because you want to you want to start moving quantumly. Now, what's the difference between the quantum economy and the normal economy? Well, the normal economy is very linear. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. While quantum is one, two, four, eight, sixteen, thirty two, one, twenty eight etc etc so you're doubling every time so you get to a point uh, initially and if you continue where the difference between one step and another is actually 500 steps if you want to make 500 steps in one step then you need to be joining the quantum economy and this book will tell you how so click on the link below to order your copy of the quantum economy and let's get and learn more about the quantum economy by talking to chris crone and see uh, hear about his story his success story and how private jets is playing a key role in propelling him through the quantum economy off we go hi chris welcome to the show great to have you here with us today to talk about your success story about private jets about how you use private jets as a business tool but let's go further back back okay. in the day you, you, i read up about you 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 grew, grew up between utah and washington state um and then you graduated high school and you did a very noble thing you went on a mission Yes. Um, sure. And uh, where you were preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ for two years in a foreign language. I understand. Did you speak German before you went? Or, or no, not? I, I didn't. But my father's German. So, I mean, there was definitely something taught when I was a kid and I had a very, very easy time learning the language. Ah, OK, that, that's good. So now how did that experience set you up for success for later? Well, I mean, you can imagine going to a foreign country, speaking a language that you don't speak, and then talking about, I think, probably one of the more difficult conversations, like what is the purpose of life and who are we? And, you know, how do you feel about God and, and how do you feel about your soul? Those are those are not just difficult conversations, but um, actually in, in my church, they had a way of ranking at the time the 330 different territories that made up the world. They call them missions. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. mine was designated as the third most challenging in the world at the time. And boy, did I understand why. I mean, I was in the Eastern Bloc side of Germany and dealing oh, with wow. a very, very yeah. faithless you know, group of people that for the most part were cynical, they were pessimistic, yeah. they were angry, they were bitter. Um, and uh, so I got to spend two years in that environment, which by the way, was filled with a lot of rejection, but a lot of beauty. And so my experiences were, were, were soulful, definitely the best two years of my life. But I think I came back way more prepared for the world because I'd just done something so hard. I'm like, if I can do that, I'm sure I can do a whole lot of other things too. Yeah, yeah. My first son, he he ended up being on his mission through COVID. So mm. he had to change the way. But he's into filmmaking. So when mm. he first got out in the mission field, he said to his mission president, who's Dave Checkett, who you probably know. He oh. said, uh, President Checkett, can, uh, can I do videos? He said, no, 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 no. You, you, you go out and talk to people. And then they, they got locked down. And so he said, please, please do the videos. Yes, and I love he it. Doing video. And he, he had 10 baptisms in two years. I thought he was going to have two or three. Wow. He came back with 10. And a lot of people he contacted through social media. He Incredible. did all these videos on his phone uh, without all the fancy gear that he mm -hmm. had at home. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's an interesting. And, and as you said, it's, it's a very character building experience. Uh, that does set you up for, 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 for greater things later on. So you finished your mission, you came, you went back home and you went to Brigham Young University and you graduated in marriage, family and human development, which is interesting. Well, How brother, that, that, that's a real, that's a, that is a long random story. Like I'll make it really, really short. You know, I, yeah. I wanted to actually go to college, be a doctor. 
And okay. I had told myself my whole life, you know, I need enough money to take care of my future family, but my parents, you know, I, I come from a family of nine, eight other brothers and sisters and, and oh, parents wow. that financially didn't do well. And I'm like, okay. So, so where are you in the, in the, in the, uh, you number oh, four, four, I'm number okay. four. And I also just felt inspired like this ever since I was eight years old, I felt like I had this caught my parents fighting about the game of money. Yeah. And I felt God tap me on the shoulder and say, this gets to be yours someday. And I felt joyful about it. I'm like, okay, cool. Someday I get to learn how to do the game of money so that I can take care of them. And, and yeah. um, so when I got started in college, it was, I started taking like a bunch of pre-med classes, including chemistry, chemistry, kicked my butt. And by the time I took it, it a second you. time, it wasn't you then. It no, you. no. By the time I took it a second time, I got a worse grade. I got a C minus. And my advisor said, Chris, stop. There's a decade of this just trust me, this is not your path. And when I gave up on that, it, my, my heart sank. And so in college, um, you know, long story short, I realized that no career I was going to pick in college was going to do more than give me career with career pay. And I didn't want career with career pay. I wanted more than that. So I went outside of my university experience and concurrently um, started courting business mentors, real estate investing mentors, and I started training with them. So I kind of got two degrees at the same time. I got a degree in college that allowed me to spend time with my wife, marriage, family, yeah. human development. That's where that comes yeah. from. I also love psychology yeah. though. So a lot of okay. studying of how humans develop. Yeah. And yeah. then the other part was um, I, got, I, I got to learn real world success from people who had achieved real world success. And uh, by the time I graduated, I had a modest portfolio of 25 homes. Uh, they were paying me about $12,000 a month. And coming out of college, I didn't need to get a job. And so that really set my life up for uh, just a very, very different course. So tell us about that first real estate deal you did. How, 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 what type of property was it? How did you structure it? How did you come across it? Um, tell us about that, that, that initial one, because it's always interesting to hear how people made that first step. You know, I, I compared all 30 major real estate strategies against themselves. And when I wrote my first book, it was based on the premise that there's a best way. And I basically put this whole thesis together, the statistical analysis and built an algorithm based on what strategy is best based on what would take the least time, the least effort, the least risk, make the most money, working up and down markets and provide a service. And what I learned was that if I would buy single family homes, which is yeah. what the majority of people want, and if I would buy them below the median or significantly yeah. below the median and then rent them out for about five years, that that is actually what would make me the most money. And so I, I bought my first home. It looked a lot just like that. It was a, it was a four bedroom, two bathroom home. It had a basement apartment. And when I bought it 40,000 below market, I walked into equity. I rented out my basement and my basement covered my mortgage. So my wife and I went from throwing, you know, the cheapest so you lived in the house. You lived in the house and rented the basement out. That's what we did. Yeah. Okay. And so they call that house hacking. Uh, but okay. at the time, my wife and I, the cheapest apartment in all of Provo was this basement, single bedroom for 400 bucks a month. That's what we were paying. So to go from paying $400 a month, being really, really poor kids to yeah. living for free, that made an impression. And I remember it made an impression on my wife because that's when we started climbing out of debt that we had gotten ourselves into. Yeah. And when um, we did our second house, we used the equity from the first house to buy the second house. Same thing. We yeah. bought we bought a $90,000 discount at home that needed a little yeah. bit of lipstick and paint. And we rented it out. And we ended up selling the house and making over 130 grand on it. And after the first few months of owning it, having $600 a month cash flow, right? The tenants were in there. Yeah. They paid us you know, rent. And after all bills were paid, there was 600 left over. And I was like, wait a second. We're living in our house for free. We're getting paid $600 a month on this. And that's when my wife turned to me and she said, Chris, when can we buy our next house? And then I developed, uh, I developed a model and a system. And, and I probably went a little too crazy. You know, that was 6,500 homes ago and $2 billion in real estate. I, I got stuck on that one for a while before I moved into private equity and business and a lot of other activities. Okay. Very, very interesting. So, um, so now you're not only into real estate, you also buy businesses. Oh, yes. Um, yeah. So what type of businesses do you buy? Everything. <laughs> I, I would yeah. like to own in, in the next decade, I'd like to own 10,000 companies. And okay. yeah. um, I do a lot of that through um, consult for equity. Uh, there's a lot of mergers. There's a lot of acquisitions. Some of them are started from scratch, but we've got franchises and restaurants and I've got a lot of software fintech companies. Uh, so it, it's really a, it's a broad spectrum of companies. Really what's happened is I've, I've learned how to hack growing a business and I've yeah. accumulated some significant manpower resources of high powered executives from a number of industries and I yeah. packaged them all together. And then when I go tackle a company, I bring the brain trust together. We evaluate 
And if we tackle it, I deploy my best people on the project. And uh, yeah. that's been working fantastic. So it's basically as you've done your real estate thing, you started to build a network, look at other things. And that's how you got into investing in, in companies as well. Um, yeah. You know, real estate, the way I do it is if I can help someone buy just an, a very simple investment property, if I grow that at 34% annual ROI, yeah. 20 years later, that's 17.3 million bucks. So that's yeah. a long strategy. That's a growth strategy. Yeah. Business is a, a shorter term strategy. Actually, growth is a cash flow strategy because yeah. if you do business correctly, it's like, oh, I bought this business. It's an extra 20 grand a month. I bought this business an extra 80,000 a month. I bought this business it's an extra 6,000 a month. Now I'm just collecting businesses with excess cash flow. And it's a, it's a great hack as opposed to starting a business and being the business operator, right? Which sucks up all of your time. Real yeah. estate for me is totally passive and businesses also. Yeah, that's what Cody, you, you may, may have heard of Cody Sanchez. That's exactly what she does. Yes. And, and that's exactly what she says. She says, you know, the businesses give you cash flow. The real estate is more a long-term play. Yeah, yeah, yeah makes sense. So private jets, uh, when did you start traveling by private jet? Way too late in the game. Like, oh. I, I don't know where my mentors were like a decade earlier saying, hello, put this on your vision board. This is going to be important. Um, I really feel like I had, uh, up until I discovered um, flying private, I thought it was for like the Uber, Uber wealthy. Like I thought you had to have a net worth of like a hundred million dollars or, or whatever yeah, to be able to play in that game. And, um, yeah. and I thought you had to be liquid. So I didn't understand. Yeah. And, um, I, I bummed a ride home on my buddy's private jet from California after a conference. Yeah. And it was the most thrilling experience of my life because I was like, wait a second, we just arrived at the airport. There was no TSA. We didn't yeah. have to arrive early. It's going to fly me directly where I want to go. There's no pit stops. Um, yeah. it, it just, and it mesmerized me because um, especially being an influencer, there's a lot of opportunities, speaking engagements and things that I get that I just turn down because I'm like, no, when I fly, when I fly, when I fly commercial, which to me was the only option, even if it's first class, I'm six, four, like I appreciate the leg room. So even if yeah. I fly first class, I still have to go when the airlines tell me that there's a flight available. I have yeah. to honor their system of when there's a layover and yeah. on the return home, it's only when it's available. And so a one hour speaking engagement can take two days. Yeah. And um, so I just, I was saying no to life. I was saying no to opportunity. Uh, but I did have one moment that changed everything for me. Uh, yeah. This is, this was a couple of years ago. My, yeah. one of my UFC buddies was uh, having a fight in Mississippi and from yeah. Salt Lake city, getting to Mississippi, you have to go through Atlanta. There's no direct. Yeah. And so I left in the morning of day one of the fight that night, barely got yeah. in time for dinner to see the fight. Then I had to wait till the next afternoon to fly home. Didn't get home till the evening. Basically it took me two days. And after that moment, I said, never again, if I had had my own jet, yeah. I could have left late afternoon, yeah. had dinner on the plane, yeah. shown up in time for the fight. And I would have slept in my same bed that night. Yeah. And, and, and that's when it was over. That's a, uh, that's when I got in the game and I, I own two jets. The first one was a starter jet to kind of have an experience. And I just flew like crazy the first year trying to yeah. learn the game and have the experience. And I loved it so, what, so much. What was your first jet? What was the first jet you got? Uh, it's a Nextant 600. Yeah, oh, so yeah. Like, a, yeah, yeah. like an eight seater, like a beach jet. Um, yeah. 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 The modified beach jet. Yeah. Nextant jet 400. Yeah. 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 And um, you know, the reality is that was a fun little jet being a tall guy. That was a small jet to fit in. Yeah. Of course. But yeah. me and my family, I mean, we took that thing everywhere and yeah. uh and loved it. You know, it was um, the disadvantage is that it needs a fuel stop after two hours. So it's really yeah. regional. It's not really yeah. domestic to get yeah. anywhere in one hop. Um, but that first year it gave me, for, first of all, it more or less paid for itself because the, you know, saved me, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in taxes when I bought it. Yeah. Um, Cause I got to write off 100% of it in that year of hundred percent depreciation. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you, you know, and then after uh, chartering it out when I wasn't using it, you know, basically got me, pretty dang close to a break even. So yeah. um, it was a good first year. And then, then, then I upgraded and uh, I still own that jet is chartered out. Now I have a Falcon yeah. 50, oh, which Falcon is, 50. Um, you know, it's a yeah. three engine. It's a bigger yeah. jet, as you know, I, I used to fly the Falcon 900. So yeah, I know what the Falcon I, 50 is. Similar, and I love the 900. So the 50 has been great. It's got nine seats in addition to the two pilots and the stewardess or the flight yeah. attendant. Yeah. And um and it has a lot more lead. It has a lot more, uh, you know, it's, it's a, it's a very tall fuselage. So it, yes. I, I still have to duck being six, four. Um, yeah. One day I'm going to own my challenger or something that's going to let me actually stand up full height. But outside of that, uh, yeah. that, that jet is, 
that's that's been amazing. And so how long have you had the Falcon 50? About a year. Oh, okay, good. So you're managing to go all over the US in it. Do you go international in it as well? Yeah, we just got back from Iceland. Um, oh, yeah. Took my other jet down to uh, the Galapagos, Ecuador. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's, yeah, we've we've definitely used and abused that thing. That's good, 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 good. Interesting. Uh, how come you chose the Falcon 50? What what made you go down that route? Because it's quite an old airplane. Yeah, so I uh, one of the hacks that I learned along the way is that when you get a jet, people shop for a jet. And I don't think you should shop for a jet. I think you should shop for the charter company if you're going to charter it out. Yeah. And charter companies simultaneously broker jets most of the time. Yeah. Yeah, they and do. so for me, I, what I needed was I didn't want to get a P&L from a broker on a jet yeah. that – um, wasn't going to back up any of the claims because a different company was going to charter it. So yeah. I found the charter company that I really, really liked that I had switched over to after my first one. Yeah. And I liked them so much. I said, I- I'm ready. Find me something that is eight to 10 seats. Find me yeah. something that I can almost stand up in. And they brought that jet. That jet actually was owned by a mutual friend of mine. So I got to see the P and L's for the whole year and okay. I liked what I saw. And so yeah. I just, I-, I looked at what my owner flight hours were probably going to look like. Yeah. And I just said, shoot, you know, um, I'm still in the year where I get the hundred percent tax write-off. So yeah. between the write-off and then between chartering it out, the jets actually just worked out really well. So it was, it was nice for me not to look at a jet, but rather a charter company, their faith yeah. in it. And also what the P and L up in that time actually was in, in real life. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's important. Yeah. Because there's so many spreadsheets out there and you need to, if, if you can see a spreadsheet of that particular airplane, of the yeah. owner that flew last year, then you've got the real numbers. Yeah. And that, that, that's really, really important. So um, tell us about how you use the jet to do deals. Um, tell us a couple of stories about you, you went out with a jet and if you hadn't had the jet, it wouldn't have happened. Just to talk us through. I mean, one of my, first of all, I don't know what it is, but if you've never been on a private jet, for those that are listening, yeah. It concocts a, a very specific energy of opulence, abundance, prosperity. And I'm talking about a, a feeling. It evokes something in people. So anytime... It elevates you know, your frequency, as they say. Yeah. yeah. And and so when I'm with people on that jet, it inspires very interesting conversation. And since I fly with a lot of business owners and entrepreneurs, yeah. it really becomes a catalyst for doing deals. Um, yeah. I had a, a buddy of mine who had donated several hundred thousand dollars to my private foundation. And, yeah. and as fulfillment, I was taking them to LBI in Jersey to, yeah. you know, with some of the other donors to just spend some time with them and to thank them for their investment and to do some masterminding and some business training. Okay. And on the jet ride home, he brought up this business idea that he'd been working on for eight years. He had been working on the software. Yeah. It was like 90% complete. And to finish yeah. it, you know, to get it really done, he needed you know, probably a million bucks and share with me what the tech was. And this software yeah. is going to revolutionize the entire supply trade um, industry. So yeah. everyone knows what supply chain is because we've had such problems with it since the pandemic. Yeah. But um, what the technology does is it basically takes what Walmart and, um, you know, it, it, large corporations like Walmart and Home Depot, they use something called split pay. That means yeah. that vendors can house their goods at their retail store. And when things are sold, it automatically just splits. Most retailing doesn't that work that way. If I'm a brand and I've created crap in my manufacturing plant, I send it out to retailers and I usually don't get paid for three to five months. Yeah. And, and um, what that means is uh, that the inventory managed by these retailers, they, they don't do very well inventory management. So I don't get a lot of feedback as the brand. Well, we decided to take split pay and make it available to all brands everywhere. And as we've been rolling that out, companies are signing up left and right saying, take 10% of all sales on the retail side and in exchange, give us all the real-time data so that we can make and send exactly what we need to create pure efficiency. Yeah. And um, that whole business came to me and I, I came in as a 45% stakeholder in that company. And, um, you know, I was able to throw my money in, bring some infrastructure and team. And now yeah. we've hit the ground running with it. And th- dude, that company literally has hundred billion dollar potential on the small side. Yeah. That deal, yeah. that deal came together on a jet. And yeah. so, um, jets have become a really common place for business deals to, to come together. I'm actually sitting here next to my videographer, Ethan. And he's like, I've been on the jet holding the camera, filming those conversations. Like I was watching history being made. Um, yeah, so, you know, jets for me actually are not just about the destination. 
It's yes. also about who you're taking with you because when I go somewhere, it, you know, I've, I've got a small crew. I've got my videographer because of all my, you know, I get about 10 million social media views a week. So I've got, yeah. I'm going to be recording my social. I've got my PR guy, maybe one other member of my team. I have four or five other seats on my jet often. And so what I've been doing is I've just been asking myself, who are intelligent people that I can put on the jet? Um, even like my, my sales team does sales between twenty five and hundred thousand dollars on some of my product lines. And I said this week, um, hey, anyone that buys anything twenty five k on up, tell them that they can have a private jet ride with me. And over the next year, we'll pop two here and two here and two here and two here, and yeah. the jet will literally make me hundreds of thousands of dollars this week um, that it wouldn't have. Or another one, I, w I flew down. I uh, had an opportunity. One of my business heroes uh, and mentors is yeah. uh, someone whose software has made me a lot of money, and that's that's um, uh, Russell Brunson. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. It's great. Click funnel, yeah. Click Click funnel, funnel. right? Yeah. And uh, he was having his private shopping day with a gentleman um, named Bart that is now friends of mine that went to my event with this team and had a crazy experience. And he basically said, "Chris, I want to introduce you to Russell. You need to meet him." And yeah. he said, "Russell's paying me to basically spend two days in Vegas shopping for his Funnel Hacker Lab event." He said, "Why don't you come along?" And so I got to spend two days with Russell just getting to know him. And on the way home, it was weird, but I found out he was flying Delta. And, oh. and I said, well, I'm, I'm, you know, from Vegas, I'm being dropped off in Provo and I'm dropping off Bart in Idaho. And you're just a little click away. Why don't you catch a ride home with me? Yeah. And, um, you know, it was fun for me just to be able to give the gift of a yeah. private jet experience to someone that, you know, wields a lot of great influence and yeah. we don't need each other in business, but who knows what we ever might do. And it was yeah. just cool. It was just kind of a cool thing to do. So the jet has been, um, I mean, the, the jet monetizes in like a million different ways for me. It's what it feels like. Yeah. I, so I tell people, you know, don't look at it from a spreadsheet standpoint because that's the wrong way to do it. The private jet is like innovation. You can't measure it before you do it. You can only measure it afterwards. If you're using it in a smart way like you are and you're using it to go and pick people up and come to see you or as you, or as you do, you know, bring people with you on. who What, what interesting people can I bring along to this next flight I'm doing? And then talk to them and, and, and people have ideas and they're inspired by the environment. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, I did an interview with a gentleman last week and um, he, he flies his um, citation jet around and we, he brings his team and he says to his team, OK, guys, this flight today is costing us twenty thousand dollars. So I want you to come up with an idea worth more than twenty thousand dollars while you're on the flight. Yeah. And he said, and every flight they deliver. It's not um, hard. Yeah, I was yeah. actually joking with Russell. We got on the flight and while we're taking off. I said, now you understand the one caveat. He said, this is not a free flight. He's like, we have to walk away with one billion dollar idea, you know, or else, yeah. or else we got to get yeah. off. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I was joking, yeah. of course. Um, yeah. But actually I'm doing a deal with another buddy of mine right now that I met on a private jet. Um, he was also, we were both high, high donors for Tim Tebow for his foundation on sex trafficking. And, and so we were going down to Florida to meet together. And uh, I said, well, why don't you catch a ride from Arizona with me? So him, him and his wife and my wife, we're all on the jet going to the foundation um, get gala. And while we were on the jet, we really got to know each other's business. Right now, next Tuesday, my team is vetting him to include him in my Reg A fund, where I'm probably going to do a little test and push 5 or $10 million his way. And then after that, might turn into something significantly bigger. And that yeah. dude knows how to freaking ROI entitlements in real estate like nobody else's business. Wow. And that was just another deal formed on the jet. So uh, the, the jet is a, um, I think it's, it's, it's not for me just about doing deals and monetizing. It's where I really like to spend time with people that I really want to get to know deeply. Yeah. Yeah. That, Cause that it's, if, if it's quality people that have done quality things in our life, there's nothing like a jet, jet ride to create an environment to really get to know each other in a way that can produce possibility. And I, and I gather you, you have a flight attendant that serves food on the flights. Yeah. That's, that's, that's an important touch as well. Um, I, I've been telling Grant Cardone that I know Grant, he's been on the show a few times. Mm -hmm. And I said to Grant, I said, you need to get yourself a flight attendant to serve some food. Um, but he, him, him and his family, they like to do everything themselves. So you know, everybody's got their own style. Um, but he uses the jet in a similar way that you do. Um, so it's interesting. Now, what business opportunities do you see in today's economy? Because obviously there's a lot of, talk about inflation and this, that, the other, but you know, people like yourself are still doing deals. Um, what opportunities are there? What, what Man, I, I, I love a great rotten economy. I just want to take this moment to thank president Biden for his special economics package. He's brought to our country the last couple of years, um, mm. a bad economy, a recession. Mm. Uh, the news will tell us is really awful. And the majority of people will, will they'll, they'll go full ostrich. They'll put their head in the sand and they'll just ignore yeah. everything. Yeah, exactly. Um, 
you know, but the reality is the bigger the problem for an entrepreneur, entrepreneurs look for problems to create solutions. And so um, this economy is riddled with all sorts of opportunity. You know, right now, people are saying with high interest rates and high inflation that you've just got to, you know, duck out, and not do anything. Uh, but the reality is there's a lot on sale right now because of that. You know, we're missing 6.5 million homes in this country. Yeah. And I've transacted a couple billion dollars worth of real estate over the last 20 years. And as such, these high interest rates are good for me because I have a model that can sustain higher interest rates because I go into out of 324 markets nationwide, the top five markets actually have the highest growth and the highest cash flow. And yeah. the higher interest rates are completely sustainable in those markets. So what I'm doing is I'm getting better buys because of the pressure in the economy. There's a lot of people who have lost confidence in real estate. So I'm picking up those deals actually at better bargains. And yeah. then the higher interest rates is a temporary problem because listen, we're going to get a new president in the next couple of years. And when we do, the only way the current po president has a shot of being popular again, in my opinion, there's one, only one thing they can do lower the rates, which makes money move again. And it helps businesses breathe again. You know, we're sitting this year already at three. Yeah, and that's coming. That's coming around the corner, isn't it? Next four or five months, the interest rates are going to come down. They're saying the same thing here in England. Yeah, we, we, rates are going to be high, I think, through the end of the year. But then it's next year. They've got to systematically drop them. And they're projected by Rocket Mortgage to drop to around 4%. Yeah. which is very, very significant. So any house that I'm buying, I can refinance anyway, but yeah. their cash flow sustainable in, at this interest rate anyway. You know, when I, when I make money in real estate, I, I don't make money on the, on the cash flow. That represents a very tiny part of the ROI. Um, yeah. The real reality and the real opportunity right now in the world is that because we're missing six and a half million homes, once they start dropping rates, real estate is going to climb skyrocket. So I'm, I would not be surprised if these entry-level single-family homes I'm buying for $250,000 go up $100,000 in value over a 12 to 24-month period of time, kind of like it did during the pandemic. I know it's not affordable, and I know eventually yeah. there has to be a correction, but you can't have a correction when you're missing 6.5 million homes. So real estate, I think, is one of the big opportunities. And then I think the other big opportunity is business. There's a lot yeah. of, you know, so far this year to date, we have the, for the first two quarters, we have 340 bankrupt businesses. Now that's the highest number we've seen since 2010. That tells us to me, that tells me we're already in, semantically, we're already in a recession. No one wants to say it because it, it, it hurts, you know, the, the politics reputation. Yeah. Um, but we're in a recession right now. And no, you know, like we, we, we know this and when businesses are struggling, it does create an opportunity for them to form strategic partnerships, you know, I've got cash. So when I give cash to these companies and buoy them up and then provide innovation, there's an opportunity for next level of growth. So it makes companies a lot more open-minded. And then on top of that, you, you just have the new tech plays and the disruption that the, that the oh, market yeah. is, is fostering and creating right now. So we're looking, we're looking for that. For example, I just sat down yesterday with, um, with a couple of guys that I've known for a long time. And mm -hmm. two years ago, they started a software company doing solar. Now, the problem with solar is solar is very lucrative, but it requires a door-to-door -door salesman or someone over the phone, and it's very complicated. They yeah. found a way to use AI and basically put it all into a software. That okay. company, if they get that out appropriately to the world, it's, yeah. it's going to be game over for their company. They're looking at giving me equity in the company and me helping use my social media influence and other advisory yeah. board to help grow their company. And that's a powerful innovation. So innovation is everywhere. Opportunity is everywhere. You'll just never see it if you listen to the media. Yeah. So- Chris, you're obviously someone that's focused on continuously learning and you read books. What have you what books have you read recently or that you are reading right now that you find really inspiring and interesting? And what type of books do you usually tend to read? You know, there's only really two types of books. When I was a kid, I'd read fantasy novels. But yeah, what, okay. really, what really uh, what interests me the most these days, it's either business books uh, yeah. or it's some type of personal development psychology book. Um, you know, so on that side of the fence, recently I read Joe Dispenza. He he's written a number of really, really great books. Um, but yeah, I like his stuff as well. Joe Dispenza, yeah, he's good. Yeah, his books about meditation are they're just fantastic. They're very practical, yeah. sometimes hard to read, but very worthwhile. Um, yeah. I'm reading a book right now called Ex Existential Kink that yeah. has to do with how we put ourselves at odds with pain and suffering in our life and how you actually come to grips with it. Yeah. Um, you know, I just read Jesus in the Essenes. It was a fascinating read on yeah, yeah hypnotic yeah. regression and one person's experience that supposedly lived at the time of Christ of what their experience with them was like as their, as his teacher, you know, yeah. it's like, so those books are, are very fascinating to me. And then of course I'm reading all the business books. My, my most recent business book 
freedom of responsibility, uh, the story of Netflix uh, for any okay. business owner. How yeah. on earth do you scale so fast with, yeah. um, you know, without creating a million policies that put a stranglehold on the company? And, and that was a fantastic read as well. So um, generally I'm reading uh, about a book a week and yeah. um, just to really keep up and just keep dumping the knowledge in. Yeah, yeah. Same, same here. Great, great. Now, um, you homeschool your children. Is that correct? I use a different term. I, I think okay. homeschool for most people usually means the kids stay home and mom and dad teach. And that's not happening. Um, yeah, we, we, we've hoped, well, not, we, we world schooled our kids. Yeah, uh, world, world school. school. And, and I just call it private education because I, I, I hire my private teachers. Okay. And then I bring them into my home and my kids are educated in my home by some of the most educated human beings on the planet. Nice. And you, and you take your kids on the private jet to visit different places. Oh yeah. That's, yeah. Actually yeah. one of my favorite trips last year, we just went to the redwoods in California. It was a simple trip, but yeah. the, uh, the forest, I think it can be such an inspiring and beautiful place to see those ancient 2000 year old trees. And, um, you know, we took another trip to, to Southern California and we rode e-bikes along the coastline for 30 miles. Yeah, um, uh -huh. We kind of taken our kids everywhere. And part of world school really has been integrating education. You know, we just recently spent two and a half weeks in Japan and I, I didn't take my jet on that one. Um, I didn't want it sitting, if you will, for three weeks. Yeah. There was probably a delta yeah. of a couple hundred grand. Yeah. So I was just like, nah, we'll charter it out and um, we'll just do yeah. business class. But yeah. um, that that trip was, um, you know, was just all based on what they've been studying for months in their in their core education courses. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because uh, my family and I just finished being in the British pageant here in England. Mm -hmm. And one of the families we met, uh, this guy was an executive of a company, real estate company in Australia. At some point, he said, forget. So he left his job, sold the house, sold the car, took his wife and five kids, and they traveled the world for seven years, literally okay. lived all over the place. Yeah. Um, and now he's a, a, a leadership coach for an online um, homeschool thing. And, mm -hmm. But his kids have had some amazing experiences. Um, and so we, we, we chatted a bit, exchanged notes because we've homeschooled all four of our children. Our oldest is 22, youngest is 15. Mm. Um, and we've lived in Italy for a year. We lived in the Middle East two and a half years and over here in England. And we've traveled to, same to America and Canada. Um, so they're used to being on planes and meeting people from, from different parts of the world and that. And of course, today with social media, you can keep in contact with everybody. It's just easy peasy. I know like back in my day where you had to write a letter and then wait three months or, or pick the phone up yeah. and it cost you like fifty dollars to do a five minute phone call. Um I so you, you would you wouldn't make the phone call. But yeah, so so yeah, so you're homeschooling your kids, great. Um you're using the jet to do that as well. Another another uh, way of using the jet. Now, in closing, what three things do you think a young person today should do in order to become successful? Hmm. So young, my, my young son, Benjamin, who's 22, for example, what advice would you give him? He's young, he's, he's going to be doing filmmaking at BYU next year. Yeah. He's been doing some YouTube stuff. He's done his mission. But, you know, he's, what, what advice would you give to somebody like that? So 94% of Gen Z fancy yeah. themselves entrepreneurs in the making. Yes. Um, they, That's what my want to do. They, they want something very, very, very different than what even the millennial generation wanted. We're doing a, a, a hard hairpin turn on our education model in the world. And for good reason, because even with now the advent of AI, which I use everywhere in my companies, um, Google, when it came about, taught us what AI teaches us how, and in many cases does it for us. So yeah. accessing knowledge is more important than memorizing and roting um, a lot of the information that's out there. So the first thing that I would say is learn how to be a person of value. Yes. Money is a store of value. So instead of Jim Rohn, you, you may have listened to Jim Rohn. I trained with Jim Rohn back in the mm -hmm. days of Herbalife. And he said an important phrase that stuck with me since he said, you don't get paid for your time. You get paid for the value you bring to the marketplace. So yeah. concentrate on increasing your value. Yeah. And so, um, you know, all, all of my kids this year, one of our focuses in our, in our private school education is whereas many parents will spend three, four, five hundred dollars a month per child on clothes and the things they need and their, and their, and their instruments and, and, and activities. My mm -hmm. wife and I don't do that. We don't mm -hmm. buy our kids stuff anymore. What we do mm -hmm. is we've created a home economy where um, beyond basic chores, they now get to earn all the money they need for doing all the things that they need to do so that they don't wind up entitled. We have a very, very entitled generation because it mm -hmm. turns out when you give people some things and they didn't deserve it, 
that yeah. they let it go to their head and they form a mindset that just says the world owes me something and the world owes me a living. And I don't believe in that. I, so mm -hmm. what I'm doing is I'm teaching my children how to be um, a value. And so I have them obsessing on what do you like doing and how can you monetize that? How can you create value? What are things that you can do? And my, my son dropped flyers off around the neighborhood and, and grabbed yeah. everyone's garbage can and pressure washed them and provide clean garbage cans to people. Um, okay always looking for an opportunity to express entrepreneurship and not because I want them to be entrepreneurs like dad, but rather entrepreneurs are a lot more self-sufficient, self-sustaining yeah. entrepreneurs understand when I need money. I don't ask my boss for a raise. I go to myself and I ask, how do I create value in the world? So that, that would be my first advice, which is to okay. value, really, yeah. really focus on how you create value as a human being. Mm -hmm. um, the exercise I actually love to give people is, Number one, imagine that you're fired and you're unhirable for the next decade. How are you going to pay your bills? And there's a beautiful education that comes when you have to make your own money versus relying on someone else to make it for you with your help. Yeah. Um, I think the second piece of advice that I would give mm -hmm. uh, has to do with the mental health crisis that is happening. Um, this generation yes. of kids with access to social media they have accounts, they make posts, and then if they don't get liked by people or rather they get scrutinized and scourged and trolled by other people, they lower their self-esteem. We have the highest generation of suicide. We have the highest generation of depression and happiness. People are on pills and um, it's a, I look at how we got here and it's because we have a very, very mentally weak generation. There needs yeah, to be some em emotional intelligence training and that training is out there. I, I put on events with my foundation where we provide that emotional intelligence training and so even if it's just reading books to learn how to gain a view of the world, to realize your feelings are your own, you're in charge of them. No one's doing them to you. They're yours. That's mm -hmm. the second thing I think young people need. I think they need a reality check on the fact that their feelings are there for them to master. They provide clues of things that aren't right in the world. And then they can diagnose from there and actually make corrections so that they can live a better life. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then the third, third piece of advice that I, I would give is, uh, you know, I believe that leaders are readers. And I would yes. just, I would challenge everyone minimally to read two books a month. And, you know, I wake up at 4 a.m. every morning to read. And that's a part of my morning routine. And mm -hmm. when I wake up, my mind is just fresh, bright, and ready. My, my body might be tired, but my mind is ready to go. Mm -hmm. And um, putting knowledge in my head every day is, you know, it's the least form of mentorship, right? Like if you could, if you could mentor with someone that um, has made a billion dollars or, you know, can show you how to make a hundred thousand dollars from a simple side hustle or can mentor you on something else. That's the most powerful form of mentorship is learning from someone who's relevant today, who's done it. But in lieu of that very cheap and very inexpensive yet, yet hugely available are books. And so just nice. being a reader, being in the habit of, of reading and consuming books, I, I think is, um, is a lifelong practice that will continue to give you stacked ROI on top of each other forever. Yeah. And also listening to podcasts. There's a lot of podcast mm -hmm. shows out there. Yeah. these days i mean I, I i i most podcasts i listen to at two times the speed um yeah. so i can get through an hour podcast in half an hour yep um and that that works it's a bit like speed reading um so i i find myself i mean i read about a book a week like yourself yeah. um i used to read a lot more but now i'm find myself listening to a lot a lot of podcasts yeah. um and there's a lot of really interesting podcasts out there uh, that deliver a lot of value um and it's interesting to to tune in there also because i've noticed uh other thing with this younger generation they're not into reading as much as maybe yeah. you and i yeah they're more into watching videos or listening to something um if you look at the stats on on the sale of books on amazon for example you find out that you know 35 percent of the sale of a particular book is actually through audible yeah so people are listening to books yep um and so that's an interesting Thing. Well, in my, in my home, part of our home gig economics is that I'll pay my children for doing certain physical activities or when they create value above and beyond their chores. But also I pay them to do education outside of their schooling regimen. And it's a yeah. choice if they choose to take advantage of it. And um, when they watch videos, uh, it converts to half the money than if they read a book. And that way I'm trying to kind of fight a little bit against that notion that says, hey, there's still value in books, even if you're listening Versus yeah. watching a video, um, yeah. so yeah, I believe in that. Yeah, very much. If you if you if you were to map someone's brain when they read compared to when they listen or watch, you see there's a lot more brain activity when you're reading. Yeah. Um, and so I think you know kids are missing out if they're not reading. Um, I mean, Elon Musk suggests to read 
fiction as well as non-fiction. I, I try and read one fiction book as well. I like science fiction because I'm into aeroplanes and that. So it's kind of what it does for me. It kind of gives me ideas for the future. Mm. What if, what if, what if, um, even if it's not a real thing, but it, it gets you in that what if mode. Creative. Um, and I find that not only inspirational, but also therapeutical <laughs> to a certain, I mean, obviously depending on what you read, but I mean, I, I kind of pick and, uh, and that, but I, I, I enjoy doing that as well, which is interesting. Chris, very cool. thank you very much for your time. Um, we will post all the links below. People can reach out to you. Thank you so much for, for being on the podcast and uh, we'll hope to speak to you again soon. Thank you. Now, what a great interview with Chris Crone. Great business advice there towards the end when he talks about the three bits of advice he give to young people and lots of inter- insight is how the private jet is a catalyst for his business and how he uses it in a really, really smart way, not only to build his business, but also to take his family with him around the world as he, as he well schools his children with his wife. Um, so it's a great, great story. Now, if you're thinking, you know, Chris said, you should have started 10 years earlier. Maybe I'm in that situation. You want to really join the quantum economy now? You need to get yourself a copy of my book, The Quantum Economy. Click on the link below. I'll take you straight to the link. And um, to get yourself a copy, ships worldwide in 24 hours. So you get it right away. It's a nice book. Hardback as well. 170 pages. Quick read. Um, tailored for people that are busy like yourself. So uh, that's the first thing you need to do. The other thing you need to do is subscribe to my newsletter. Lots of information on that one. The link for that one is below two. And the other thing I would suggest is getting on a one-to-one call with me because we can only give so much information here on Bizjet TV and I can only give you so much information in my book. Then we really need to customize for you and we need to craft a private jet strategy for you. And you can do that by just pinging me an email, get you scheduled in on a call and uh, we'll come up with that strategy for you to propel you into that quantum economy. So you can stop making those one, two, three, four, five, six little steps and start making those quantum steps where each step is worth a thousand steps how about that one that's a great one and if you haven't already checked out this other interview i did with a gentleman who bought his honda jet with bitcoin and he flies it himself he's building his business around america flying his honda jet having fun flying the honda jet the business is paying for everything he bought it with bitcoin you'll hear about that story it's an interesting one too if you haven't subscribed to budget tv subscribe comment below give us a thumbs up and as i said check out this video i did about buying your private jet with bitcoin and that's all from Fabrizio Pali on this episode of Bizjet TV and I will see you on the next one thank you